Final Fantasy VII is possibly Square Enix's most popular titles, next to Kingdom Hearts. With all the spin-offs and the movie, and an OVA that most people don't even know about, was made for fans. And I am definitely one of those fans. I love Final Fantasy VII, it's very near and dear to my heart. I've probably played that game more than any other, and Ocarina of Time is a very close second. Before I get into this video, I just want to say that this is my second and a half time playing the remake of Final Fantasy VII. I know that my opinions are going to be subjective, and many will not agree with what I have to say. But, that is what's great about our world. You can have different opinions, and this is mine, and I don't expect anyone to have the same. I will also be spoiling Final Fantasy VII, the remake, and Crisis Core. If you don't want those games spoiled in any way, I highly suggest you go play those games first, then come back. If you keep watching and you get spoiled, well, I told you. I want to be fair as possible, so I am going to be mentioning things I do enjoy about the game. Now this list may be shorter compared to what I have negatively to say about it, but this comes from a place of love and disappointment. I like the character and the world design. You cannot take away from the talent they have at Square Enix. The game is gorgeous and it's one of the best looking RPGs ever. They accomplished this on the PS4. It's really impressive, which is why a lot of the other talking points end up being so frustrating. I loved being able to see this world and all the enemies with more modern graphics. This has the feel I would imagine it would have, along with all the animations they did too. It is definitely a technical wonder. However, good graphics alone don't make a good game. I tend to play these types of games in Japanese because I feel like the English voice acting isn't always the best match. This time around, I did feel like voices and performances match the character. Who am I kidding? I'd probably try to tear your head off. Hey Tifa, know anything about ancients? I know I've heard of them at least. They come up in planetology books. The game genuinely made me laugh at times. Cloud calling Jesse desperate. My roommates should all be out for a while. Are you seriously that desperate? Tifa's remarks about Cloud dressed as a lady. Oh my god, that makeup! And that dress! Nailed it, I know, thank you. Moving on. Jesse smacking Wedge on the ass. Wow! <laughs> the teacher from the Leaf House who wants to be a dancer. What are you doing here? <sighs> well, if you must know. I've wanted to be a dancer ever since I was a little girl. I come here at night to live the dream. Some other moments definitely made me laugh and smile. A newly added character I enjoyed was Roach. He was really funny and sucks you only saw him in the one part. I felt like it would have been a good change of a boss encounter during the highway chase, but no. You just fight the robot at the end like the original. A rare moment I would actually enjoy to see a change in the story with. I enjoyed the music, a lot of the reimaginings of the classics are done well. And a lot of the new music is great, too. One song in particular reminds me of the Makalania Woods from Final Fantasy X. I didn't end up liking Jessie a lot more than I thought I would, but I do feel like most of her story and anything to do with Biggs and Wedge expanded upon didn't add anything, just, it was just there. But out of the ancillary trio, I did enjoy Jessie quite a bit. She was a really fun character. I partially like the combat with the mix of turn-based and action, but it ultimately is flawed on how they built the game, in my opinion. It was nice to see the material system was basically unchanged. It pretty much works the same like it did in the original game. I also enjoy the weapon upgrade system. Being able to increase your stats and the ability to add material slots can make early weapons viable in the end game. Having abilities to unlock with different weapons is a nice touch too. This kind of forces you to try out new weapons, but allows you to have all of the abilities and choose the weapon you want to use. Before I go into the issues I have with combat, I want to say that I'm more likely very underleveled for this playthrough. I played through the game as fast as I could and didn't do any of the side quests, so some of the topics I bring up may be moot if you were higher level. Combat has some balancing issues. The amount of damage the player outputs is really low compared to the enemies and bosses. Let's look at another remake they made within the same franchise. Here is the final boss in Crisis Core. Look at the difference! They stay completely true to the game and allows you to output a ton of damage if you built your character right matching the huge HP pulls enemies and the boss have. Even though you can do a lot of damage, you still take a lot of damage as well. All the while to keep your HP up with skilled items and magic. Meanwhile, in the Final Phase 7 remake, regular enemies can just make your attacks not matter and have you do very little to negligible damage. Just possibly related to the stagger system that they've been implementing in all their games. You know, since Final Fantasy 13. If you're able to work towards getting a boss to stagger, it cannot matter sometimes. Bosses can just do whatever they want, it seems like. If your stagger is at a phase change, well, you just don't get to output the extra damage you worked for. The boss has to fly around and show how much money they spent making the game. 
Depending on the enemy or boss, it is easier, more difficult to provide enough damage to cause a stagger. Which you do the most damage with magic and abilities, I understand there are also weaknesses for enemies as well, except you have a very tiny mana pool for magic, but if you don't have the active time battle bars available for yourself or non-active characters, then you cannot use said abilities or magic or items. Active time battle bars are rarely available for non-active characters. I get you're supposed to switch between characters that have more dynamic fighting, but it could have been implemented a lot better. A lot of the combat is also kind of boring, especially the boss fights. They all just feel like they last for way too long. When I got to the last few chapters of the game, I found a story mode that makes you very overpowered, just to not have to deal with all the massive health pools for the bosses you go up against at the end of the game. So some of the footage you will see me doing a stupid amount of damage and have extremely high HP and MP. I feel like Tifa is the most fleshed out when it comes to combat, especially later in the game. She's able to stack abilities and completely change the way she fights throughout an encounter, and has a lot of fun abilities to use. Not that Cloud doesn't have any fun abilities, but he feels a lot more bare bones, along with Aerith and Barret. Showing Sephiroth as much as possible. Uh... Every time he was on screen, I groaned so much out loud and felt annoyed that he was even being seen. This ruins the mystique to his character. He has to possess insurmountable strength and was the strongest soldier in history. Very little else was known about him. Throughout the original game, he shows his strength in so many ways and what you're going to have to go up against without fully understanding his seemingly boundless limits. This is how you build a villain, not what they decided to do in this. Oh look, it's Sephiroth! Did you think you're going to play a Final Fantasy VII game without seeing Sephiroth? Well, don't worry! You'll get all the Sephiroth you want! Apparently the director felt like everyone knows about Sephiroth already, so there was no reason to hold back showing him from the get-go. To let everyone know he is Cloud's adversary which completely misses and ruins what made him an interesting antagonist to begin with. The majority of the story is supposed to be a big mystery, which makes sense because the original story concept was a detective story. Final Fantasy VII Remake only taking place in Midgar. The director mentioned they wanted to expand on Midgar, the story, and the game as a whole to have the game feel more immersive. Along with Midgar being such a strong first act, it made a lot of sense to expand upon it. Now, look at this quote. Midgar is iconic to Final Fantasy VII, so we had to start the game there. Of course you'd have to start the game here. It's the beginning of the story. That could possibly be a translation issue, but man. I never thought about starting a story at the, be be at the beginning. <laughs> oh man, what they've done with this story. <sighs> the thing is, you really don't see much more of Midgar compared to the original. All the same locations are pretty much here, except some added sections that weren't in the original but really didn't give much of an excuse to have it just be in Midgar and take place in the first 10-15% to 15 of the story. This game has a ton of padding, partially with some of the extended areas, all the side quests they added, and the combat. Or just having some parts be slow to keep up playtime, like these robotic cans for example. You wanna know what this was in the original? Yeah, it was just part of the pre-render, of a very short screen. There was no reason to have this be a thing. Along with some sections, there were supposed to be high stakes. Music is vamped up, and you gotta go! Oh wait, hey, you need to squeeze through these crates. Oh wait, you have to go bounce across this beam. It really took me out of the moment. The Shinra testing facility is completely new, and again, doesn't really feel like it adds to the story. I get it's supposed to show Shinra isn't against testing on humans and alluding to Hojo, but it's just padding to me. Then there is the lead up to climbing the wall. In the original, it was a quick jaunt to the wall market. Seeing some kids wanting to look at the devastation, you talk to the weapon store merchant, get some batteries, boom! You're on your way climbing the wall. However, the remake feels like it is necessary to bring back Corneo. I know Corneo has a reappearance in Wutai in the original game, but Wutai isn't in this game, so that's kinda moot. And also to show this new character, Leslie! You know, so you can learn all about this guy, and why he worked for the Don while also trying to get information from the Dawn to possibly know where to look for Aerith. Again, it just doesn't add anything to the story. They just wanted to try and justify why they made the first game only in Midgar. In all honesty, chapters 13 and 14 could not be in the game, and you wouldn't miss anything. The Shinra building had a lot added to it. The whole thing with Hojo wanting to collect data, have you solve some simple puzzles and fight some more bosses, along with showing off more what Sephiroth is up to, which wasn't really needed at all. You were in a jail cell in the original during all of that. Again, just takes away the mystery of Sethroth and not allowing much to discover about him. There's a lot of they change with the shield of Bruning in general. Oh yeah, there's a Genova fight! For whatever reason! Which doesn't happen until you're on the ship on the next continent in the OG. 
Visiting Jesse's parents' house didn't really feel like it added much to the story either. The best part of this chapter was being introduced to Roach, which I thought was a great addition to this game. This could have been another person a part of Soldier to see you as his rival, or finding some comic relief and something new that wouldn't feel too out of place. However, Roach is only in this part of the remake. Despite this one addition I do enjoy, this is all just shoehorned in, again, to extend playtime. Which, with a video game, you're kind of wanting to waste your time, but you don't want that thing you're wasting your time on to waste your time within it, if that makes sense. Having Johnny play more of a role in certain parts of the game. This was a very minuscule and missable character at the very beginning of the original game in Sector 7 Slums. You see him run out of 7th Heaven, you talk to him, and he just talks about how drunk he got. If you leave the bar before continuing the main dialogue, you're able to see Johnny locked out of his parents' house. Before leaving for Sector 5, you can visit Johnny's parents' home and they will tell you that he left. Then you see him outside of the Honey Bee Inn. He has a similar line he says in the remake, and if you talk to him while Cloud is dressed as a woman, he has a unique response. That's it! Why would they need to expand upon this relatively ignored character? I really enjoyed the majority of Wall Market in the remake, except with everything to do with Johnny. You're able to find him at the same location as the original, but he shows up in all the key locations in the main scenario of the remake. On top of that, instead of Cloud running around in Wall Market doing all the original side quests himself, Johnny's at the front of it. This really didn't add anything as well, especially since Johnny didn't really matter as a character in the original. Showing Zack when you're not supposed to know about him yet. Zack was a huge revelation in Cloud's story. There's even a secret cutscene showing Zack breaking out himself and Cloud from Hojo's experiment in the basement of Shinra Mansion in Nibelheim. Along with them both making it just outside of Midgar, but they're caught by the Shinra army, ultimately leading to Zack's death, with Cloud taking on parts of his persona and memories from the Genova cells he was injected with. Again, not really leaving any mysteries for the story. Not being able to play as Red 13 was a slap in the face. Red is one of my favorite characters from the original game. He's even shown on the cover and seems like you'll be able to play him, but no. He's there doing his own thing and is just used for solving puzzles. I know they have him as a playable character in Rebirth. Still, feels like they should have not had Red part of the promotion material if he wasn't going to be a fully playable character. They try to make you care more about Jesse, Biggs, and Wedge to make their death scenes mean more. However, they took away a lot of that by letting everyone seemingly live except for Jesse, the character that most people enjoyed out of the Insulary Trio. I guess they wanted to be super faithful to the story and just keep the original love triangle. Zack is also potentially alive, taking away his whole story in the death scene he had in Crisis Core. Just watch this scene and tell me if it is better Zack lives in a separate or alternate scenario. Oh my god. It was one of the saddest scenes ever and takes away so much from what makes the original story so special. If they're wanting to keep him alive for whatever reason. The whispers of Gaia are arbiters of fate. Yeah, these were a huge middle figure to the players. Anytime I saw them on screen, I let it a big old groan just like when I saw Sephiroth. They're supposed to keep certain events happening to carry out the original story. Some of them interpreted these specters as the players trying to keep the story the same and not let the devs take it in a different direction. 
which they did with so many important events. Either way, Square has bastardized the story, fighting fate and destiny itself. I was literally like, what is this Kingdom Hearts bullshit? The first time I played this game. They also seem to be doing an alternate timeline or multiverse thing, which is completely played out now and doesn't add anything to this. Giving us an odd quasi-sequel that no one asked for. All the while giving glimpses of what was to come or possibly already happened. This is what bothers me the most. Square lied. This was supposed to be a pretty faithful recreation of the original story. I get with projects like these, there are going to be some creative differences. Except, that isn't a very strong argument. Look at the Dead Space remake. This is pretty much the game one-to-one, -one, with Isaac talking being one of the major updates, with added dialogue for him and between the other characters. But that added to the game and story, it didn't take anything away from it, along with adding some quality of life features. So, a remake on this scale can't stay true to the original source. I am sure there are people that love the Final Fantasy VII Remake and are excited about the changes, but I am certainly not one of those people. Square took a game and story that means a whole lot to me and a lot of other people and just crapped all over it to make the game they wanted, not for the fans that made it a huge success in the first place. And this became something that Square didn't even know they wanted. A franchise within a franchise and then chasing that lightning in a bottle ever since.